you all have introduced me and I express my deep gratitude for that. And I really thank Dr. Barwa, Dr. J.P. Barwa, the faculty and staff, students and the guests who have spared their time and come here to attend this session. But friends, what gets me here? You know, what brings me here, I always say, is and speak about this topic, which is very close to all of us as lawyers and professionals, yet we really don't deliberate as much in our legal education on these issues. And you know why? Because the moment somebody speaks about jurisprudence and its theory, the first thing we do is we just switch off. In the context we think it is rather partially relevant to our practical life. And you know, you cannot say anything other than that because that's the way we are looking into our legal education. We are dominantly case law oriented and it's recently when you have begun to look at this concept more deliberately and looking at more materials, looking at theories of justice and others. But how do I say that this is really relevant? I mean, I, I really feel that this is not just close to my heart, but it should be rather close to heart of all legal professionals. Is just that jurisprudence is like an intellectual inquiry. Into it. So you have rights and obligations and duties, but at the same time, the idea of how they will be dispensed, how they will articulate themselves and orchestrate in the larger society for social good is a very important outcome. And that's how you speak about dispensing justice. And I, in my years that I studied, I feel jurisprudence definitely is about the art as how the society would and his works. But it is a little more than what the social outcome and the challenges and the current times comes. It is jurisprudence, this intellectual inquiry is about the impact on society in the dispensation of justice across time. And I emphasize this word across time. And let me explain to you a bit on that. So let's take all of us back to 1850s, a long period back into history. And you walk up to me as a student or as a professional and say, well, all men are created equal. And thus African Americans are equal. In 1850s, I'm aghast by this statement and I retort back to tell you, well, yes, all men are created equal, but African Americans are not equal. And before I de develop this idea more, let me give you another example. So we move 50 years ahead, come to the 1900s. And 1910, I walk up to you and tell you, well, friends, it's time we start looking at women's suffrage and look at women voting in the elections. And you look back at me and say, well, no, how can you do that? Women have never voted. And so if women will vote, and that's how the way, how this whole movement went on, then humanity will be affected because the children they will bear will be as polluted as politics. But if these two things I tell you today, that all men are created equal and African Americans are not men, I won't even be able to finish the sentence before I'm silenced. And similarly, if I tell you today that women should not vote because of the reasons that I have justified before, you will say, no, what a person he is. He is speaking about women not voting at a time when equality is, is the paramount idea. And that's what I say, when you look at the dispensation of justice, the dispensation of justice not only looks at the current times, it reverberates across time and creates change. If I look at the, both the examples from the question of what law is, and I think it was very fair in 1850s to say all men are, are equal, but African-Americans are not men. Or 
say women should not play because the law of the times did say. But the progressive idea always develops through the question of justice and its dispensation across time. And this is what is the real construct of justice. Let me tell you a little more about it. You know, I'm taking this, I started this series on law and leadership classes. And I give this example, if you take the same example of the 1850 case of all men are created equal, and I say, well, that's what the law says. But that is the apparent truth. But there is an underlying issue. The underlying issue is the context of how justice would be given. Is that real equality? But if you see both of these things, when I speak on the leadership front, on, on the questions of jurisprudence and justice, I speak about how justice reverberates across time. So it's just not in the political context today, but it goes beyond time. And let me put this, this dilemma of what law is and what law ought to be. Let me start with a small example before we you know, kind of move ahead with this kind of discussion. But before I, I, I really tell you that there is the time rather is less to really, you know, put every theory here in practice or make you understand all these theories. But I'm trying to put across you of how these issues are important and will be very extremely relevant in your times as you grow up in profession. So let's take this and uh, you're driving a car. You overspeed the red light or the traffic light. Just about to hit a boy, a school going child, say, the policeman stops your vehicle and say, well, friend, you crossed, you pay a fine. Well, he says, okay. You tell him no. Mr. Policeman, please understand. I have a friend who is serious in the hospital and I am carrying blood. He has to be infused with blood. So this is the box I'm carrying. Please let me go now. And then when it comes to say, please let me go now, the policeman says, well, I have to do my duty because the law says if you overspeed, I won't let you. So you go to the magistrate and then the magistrate sits and he has the question of a choice determine it. Enforce it that you, you cross the red light or in the circumstances of how law ought to be in its grand purpose of deterrence, he will, should you be spared for crossing the red light? And the options are three, four, right? First is the, the, the magistrate follows the law unscrupulously and says, well, you violated the law as a sanction and you're here by punished with a fine whatever amount. Secondly, he looks at this and you argue it differently. You argue, sir, well, this is not I really required to go to these. And so here, the second option, he analyzes the content and he says, well, the purpose of the law is not to just be for the of, of punishing somebody. Instead, but instead, it is about how the society must evolve. And the third is you accept it that this is overseeding is not there and you find him not guilty. But in this kind of choice determinant, what is the argument that floats into anybody's mind or theoretically how the argument floats is like something like this where you say that in the element of the society, you are the sovereign, which is the state, the legislation, which legislates the laws, the judges are to interpret, and the law and the command has to be given, and the judges have discretion or no discretion. In this case, the discretion to you let you go off because you overspend, or faithfully follow the law in its spirit and make you the fine. And the sanction is because the state wants to draw obedience from you in saying that don't overspeed the light, the red light. The issue that comes up here was you know, the, the magistrate had the option to interpret it or put the law straight. 
So it is this context in whichever form in life you see that you begin to see this development. Let me give you one more example. You're, in, in, you're attacked. This robbery takes place in your house and you're attacked. And in the brawl of stopping the robber or catching the robber, the robber dies. Self-defense within the provision of the law does not exist. Okay. But in its interpretation in the circumstances in which it has happened, then it is a justified context. So how you interpret this, how the theories develop, they largely develop around the sovereign, that is the state which legislates, the judges, whether they have the discretion or not, and the law, whether you follow the law in itself, or you interpret the law more purposely, or you look at natural law provisions where you say the certain rights are inherent to you, and that's how it evolves, even if positivist law is not there. And the sanction comes into it, that you're punished for doing a wrong. But I want to give you a more, a, just to get a deeper insight, let me take up a case which developed as one of the most famous jurisprudence fictional case of the Speluncian explorers. It was written in 1940s by Lawrence Fuller, and uh, he was a professor at Harvard, and he created a fictional situation in which he ex explored this concept and theory of the jurisprudence, and he says, well, how do you argue it, okay? So let me give you this kind of a storyline into what happens. So time is 14, 4, 4, 300, and it's about May 429, 4329. And there are five amateur explorers who go exploring the cave. Amongst the five, there is Roger Wetmore, one of the persons, and the other five, and the other four. As they start exploring the chlor in one of the plateaus of the Commonwealth of Nefgat. A boulder falls and closes the entrance to the cave. As the entrance to the cave closes, they try to rescue themselves, not possible, and they stay in the cave. The family members generally know where they've gone exploring, so they tell the secretary of this Peloncian society, and he sends the initial rescue operations. And during those part of the operations, I mean the rescue team one rescuer dies. Fast forward to day 20, they realize they have wireless two-way communications phone and they establish communication with the outside world, with the rescue party. And they ask him, well, sir, how much time will it take more till we can be rescued? And the rescuing party says, well, at least 10 days if you don't have any fresh landslides. Scant on rations, they don't know what to do. So Roger Wet Wetmore takes the initiative and says, can we have the doctor please? And the medical department, the doctor comes up and he says, well, do you think we'll be able to survive 10 days in the state in which we are? And the doctor reluctantly says, unlikely. And there comes the question from Roger Wetmore. Can we consume human flesh from amongst one of the explorers? So you have to kill one person and consume flesh, human flesh, and continue with it. He remains silent. They again try to speak to the priest, the administration, authorities, everybody. Nobody gives the answer. And the wireless goes off. When the wireless goes off, sitting inside, understanding that it'll take more than 10 days for such the rescue operations to take minimum 10 days, they decide, then let's do it our way, which is let's throw, do a casting lots. We propose and Wetmore proposes casting lots and says, well, Let's cast lots. 
whoever's number comes will be killed to be consumed as human flesh. As the discussions are on, Vetmore says no. He retracts. He says, sorry, buddy. I am not going to do this. You four want to do it, do it. I cannot do this. The rest of the folk explorers say, well, this is breach. You only proposed and now that we have agreed, you're not agreeing to it. He says, okay. And one of the KF explorers says, well, Roger, if you don't want to throw this dice, can one of us throw in your name? And it won't take a chance there. The probability is just 20% of five people. So it just, it won't be, but let us throw it. Wetmore says, okay, fine, you throw it. The moment Wetmore throws it, or somebody else throws for Wetmore, his name comes and he's killed and consumed. Fast forward again, 32nd day, they are rescued. They take him to rehabilitation and the prosecutor files a case under section 12 of murder, charging them for murder. They are charged guilty and they move to the Supreme Court of the Commonwealth. So it's a five judge bench and that's how the five judges are. One was Justice Trupenny, Justice Foster, Justice Tatting, Justice Keen and Justice Handy. All deliver their judgments on guilty or not guilty whether the act of killing Roger Watmore was a case of murder or otherwise. And should they be punished under Section 12A of the Commonwealth Act. And after deliberating these judgments, this is how the arguments move. True Penny explains, he's the Chief Justice, he explains the complete situation and he says, well, the statute is unambiguous. It says it was willful. You took life willfully and it amounts to murder. So this is murder. And you, I charge them guilty. Although if it was my personal views, I would have spared. And he gives a little rider. Because I know this is a personal, as a, as a person I can't say, but I will say that they should opt for clemency to the chief executive, and I'm sure he will pardon them knowing the case. And so True Penny says they are guilty. Justice Foster comes and says, sorry, not guilty. And really, you know, agitated by the way True Penny said, that go for clemency and ask for clemency, but you are guilty. And he says, this is not the way. I don't agree to this. And this is a very, this idea is very repulsive to our go for clemency and you hold the person guilty just because you need to interpret the law. And then he says that, how do you kind of interpret it? He says that the same case would have happened beyond one mile of the jurisdiction of the Nevgar, then this issue would not have arisen. And do you really think that the courts of Nevgar Commonwealth, the judges and everybody and the prosecutors can actually break through this cave in and cave and come inside and deliver this kind of judgment. He says, no. He says, I have two issues. The first issue is the question of jurisdiction. And the second question is about, is this really the purpose of this legislation? And you just read the legislation and say, it has to have a purposive approach. So when it comes to the question of the state of nature, he says, see, how is society, how was positivism and the law comes? It's about volition. I mean, I say, yes, I want to be governed. We all agree in a society by a matter of contract and set in rules for ourselves to follow. And therefore we follow create the laws and, and thus are governed over a contract. And thus the sovereign enacts the laws, the judges give out the, the, the decisions and dispense justice. 
and if you don't do it there is sanctions because you have to ensure obedience to the kind of law he said but there was nothing like this that was existing in that cave the cave became an entity of its own and there too a similar image developed there were five people who entered into contract saying well let's do this all agreed to it and thus the state the law of nature comes into play it was a state of nature that it comes into play and they decided they were competent and they decided over it as if this is the case and when you are trying to rescue these people one person of the rescuing team died how do you justify this he said the statute also does not mention anything about self defense but you treat self defense and you do not look this section 12 makes no mention of self defense but yet you consider self defense as a legitimate act so this has to be interpreted it has to be more purposive and this was a state of nature and there is an ethical understanding of contract between this and the law of nature should prevail also natural law should prevail and foster says not guilty chatting is divided he does not know what to do he heard trupeni but he said i don't agree with trupeni trupeni speaks about his unambiguous situation he speaks about clemency i don't agree and neither do i agree with foster's idea of the state of nature because i have problem with foster because if i if you can punish a person hungry starving person for stealing bread in the commonwealth this is as much as the same thing but he says i cannot give a decision i go back justice keen says no they are guilty he as much as criticizes clemency and he says strongly he says foster has a problem the foster is trying to look at holes in the system and he is talking over the pre civil war era where there was no codification of the laws the judges had the discretion to do what they wanted to do and so they used to pass their judgment and that's not the way it works so the civil war had just ended and the codification of law had taken place he says there is a proper codification foster is behaving as if he hates he eats up a pair of shoes and you say which portion did you like the best he says the portion which had holes in it so he's trying to put find flaws in this kind of system without realizing and foster must realize that when we are sitting as a public authority then moral and the question of morality on the justice is not there it is about the way the law is and the, the way to apply the statute and that's what he is trying to say so he very strong at that view he says no they're not and he goes on to say that this is the way even he says in my personal view i would have agreed if in my personal view i would have definitely agreed but as a public servant now i will not accept i will follow it and then handy the final delivery of the uh, judgment comes from handy handy says you know you all judges are called lacking common sense as it is we are suffering with this issue that we have distanced ourselves with the common man so much there's so much of technicality in in the judgments in the procedures to be followed in the courts that as it is the common man is away from us and you made it more he said look at what the public wants try to see what the public wants and he said that i was reading a paper which said that 90% of the population actually wants that these people should be given less punishment or should be left all throughout because they have suffered enough and he argues that you see we have to have it's not about law it's not about morality but there is about something about realism what is the way you look at shape today and that's how the five people come and this house gets divided so just to give a brief troop and he says guilty he says i will interpret the statute i have my personal view but i'll not put it here clemency can be asked for foster says there is nothing like statute is a state of nature if you can sacrifice one person to while rescue operations why can they not sacrifice one person 
you need to have a purpose in which you're fighting. And if self-defense is not mentioned, please don't. Keen, as I said, he criticizes. He says the law is supreme. We are just supposed to interpret the law. And as he says, it's about public opinion. So that's how it is going to be. But let's see it now. If you see the theoretical perspective in which each of them has relied, that is that when Shrupeni calls them as guilty, he's a true old He's clear, he's dry, and he says, but personally, they're not guilty. If you see Foster, Foster follows the natural law process. He said there are ethical issues. The agreement was an ethical agreement and the natural law process is there. It should be nothing about the state of nature. When you look at, again, look at Justice Keene, he is a positive, strongly the Kelson idea that law is supreme and therefore we have to follow it. And Handy, he says not guilty. He says it's a pure idea of realism. He said law and moral have an intersection. There's a context of realism in it. So this is how I try to put it up as a strong positivist view speaking coming from uh, Justice Keene, Handy speaking about public opinion, Foster speaking about natural law, and Two Penny being a formalist. Now there's a hung case, okay? If I ask you today, and if you are Justice Statting, how would you like to say whether the Spelunian explorers are guilty of murder or are not guilty? So let's do one thing. If you are just starting, are the Spelunian explorers guilty or not guilty? So I will do one thing. I will do a polling for you. And let's see how you all respond. Okay. So it is, if you are just starting, are the Spelunian explorers guilty or not guilty? Please choose one and let's see how the poll says. Okay. I'm just being launched. So each one of you, I'll request you to give your uh, choices and see whether it's guilty or not. It's a very interesting thing that I can see. Okay. At the moment, the not guilty and guilty are just about equal, but not much. Many have kind of uh, uh, really delivered their kind of judgment till now because I only see about about 40 and we have a good strength of more than 200. So I'll, I'll request you all to keep kind of giving your points and see. I'll share this with you. So you have 18 plus, I mean, you have about 40, 40 people who have done it. So I'll request more of you. Okay, I will close after some time, but yes, it's 52, 50. Let's have at least 100 people saying so. We get a fair idea about what it is. So, okay. Okay. Can I request you all who have done it? It's fine. If not, just give your view. It'd be interesting kind of thing. We can, we can we'll take up something from here. So, let's see how it develops. Okay. So I, my, my talk is fluid. So from here, whatever it comes, I, I go ahead from here, whatever you say. Okay. Okay. I think that's reasonable number of 72. I was thinking some more would come. Okay. Let's see the poll, what it says. Okay. And I share the results with you. Okay, let's see. So I'm sure you're seeing, kind of seeing the results. A dominant portion of you are saying they're guilty and uh, a similar person, 54 to 37, I think the guilty really hold up. And uh, there is two ways and I will have the second poll and you will understand. So you, uh, most of the people say, yes, you are guilty of it. And some of them say not guilty. So let's take another poll, okay? And uh, okay, who is the most convincing in their rulings as to when you gave the judgment of guilty and not guilty? Whom do you think was the most 
most uh, convincing? Do you think True Penny was more convincing, or Foster, or Keen, or Handy, given on the choices that you have yourself given? Let's have something coming up, so then we come to know. You know, it's, it's a good kind of a building dichotomy coming up because a lot of people say guilty and uh, a lot of people here rely on Foster's uh, argument here. Okay, I end the poll and I share with you only if you're 59. I'll give a minute or a second or more, a few more if I have somebody else wants to come up in the polling again. Okay, I share these results. So the two results that I have shared with you now, okay? So most of you say they are guilty, but as far as the convincing argument comes up, you really have the idea with Foster saying Foster was there. So I think it's the majority decision has either been taken with Foster and the guilty decision has been divided with equally rather between True Penny and Keynes. No, this is, this is what I'm trying to tell you today. This is what actually I was trying to tell you. Is no theory as such has a perfect fit. Okay. No theory had a perfect fit. At the end of the day, just let me stop this kind of old. Okay. At the end of the day, just one minute, I'm just trying to settle this. Okay. Not everybody does not have a perfect fit. No theory has a perfect fit. And in the group of us as 200 people, we have also given a view of partly guilty and this is kind of a division. What is important that you come up is that no, there is no real justice for a particular theory that has come up. But each of these theories really put into it. Like if you see if True Penny was a formalist, a positivist, a natural law propagate and handy. But all of us have a divided opinion on these kind of issues. You know why this is comes up? Because every way, you look at it, and no perfect, and that's what I'm going to tell you, that while you read the theories as the ultimate end of things, the justice has to have an outcome that transcends across time. But for all of us to understand that we have to see how the theories develop to understand the purpose of what judgments have come. And I've explained to you what I mean by purpose, as I told you in the first case, that to be to be fined for overstepping the red light or not is about to understand the purpose for what it was doing. Simply to say the breach the law, to your fine simply and it's over. But that's not what it is. It is more about how the theory is developed. Let's come up to the next. So what I'm going to tell you now, when I did tell you this is not every theory will be right, but for you to know each theory will be important. And unless you understand the real theory of how it comes, the idea of how justice prevails in society and how you need to argue for the sense of justice will, will go into oblivion if you simply go to the case laws and CIP. The larger value interprets. I will tell you something. If you really unscrupulously believe that a positive approach is the best approach, possibly we'll falter. And let me give you an example. So I told you the example of all men are created equal when I took you back to 1850s. So there's a famous case called the Dred Scott versus Johnson, uh, Stanford case, Stanford case. I don't. I'm not trying to able to, sorry, I'll just, uh, 
Okay. Okay. This was the case. So when I we say uh, the theories are there and how you interpret it, but look at this. If you are the strong positivist person who believe that positive uh, law theory stands good, and see how does it go? That's why I say the outcome is more important. So this is a case of Dred Scott versus Sanford, where Dred Scott was a slave, and the option of slave emancipation was that if you go to a non-free or uh, a slave-free state, you can ask for being a free person. So Sanford goes to a free state and he files a case for his freedom. And eventually over a process, a long process, the judges rule that we interpret the law the way it is. And we said we hold that all people, all men are created equal. And thus, Red Scott says, I am equal and I need the judgment goes different, despite having going through a strong positive view. They say all men are equal, but blacks are not men at the first place. So one approach, singularly looking at it, became one of the worst decisions in US American history. It was driven by a popular majority of popular opinion of strong white population. And this judgment was delivered 7-2. So this is the way if you just simply follow. So this, if you look at the next case and you look at the kind of idea of Bentham's utilitarian idea, where you say maximum happiness principle. So let's follow this in the dispensation of justice. So let me tell you an example. It's about Japanese Americans and during the second world war. And uh, the moment about some time before when America was about to declare war against Japan, it was felt that the Japanese Americans who were citizens in America will actually create chaos. So let's put them into preventive detentions and let them put them in detention so that there is no problem because it's, it's just a minority of few people who should be and the maximum majority will be happy. So they pick up these people in minority and put them and Japanese Americans incarcerated thereafter. So they're put. Do you think Bentham's idea of utility theory, maximum happiness, really applied in the notion of justice. No. Hey, the Japanese Americans had to be put into detention for no mistake of this. So if you feel the positive view, there is an underlying factor of the, of the idea of the maximus principle or the utilitarian principle of Bentham. Let me give you another example. What if the law was not there and you're relying on some kind of, and you have no way to ahead for and then how does natural law come and help you to really get this truth through? So you go back to the Second World War. The Second World War just got over. And uh, they say the Nazis uh, should be punished for the crimes they have committed. And he says, well, let's do it. So we do it for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. So war crimes and genocide are established by others' understanding. So they do it. They have a provision. The Allied powers have a problem. They say, they, well, there is nothing called crimes against humanity except one Turkish-Armenian agreement which took place. Where Turkish and the Allied powers took place when the question about the Armenian population came. So that's the only thing we have. But if you do it, you are really doing injustice to these people. Right? So what should we do? And then they went and said, well, friend, you may not have. I, we agree that the prohibition of retroactive crimes is a principle of justice. But you will fly in the face of justice if you don't try this German book. And thus, they say about civilizations, and they say law of, the law of the nations is enough. And the way such peoples have committed such crimes, so grave for humanity, that even if we don't have a legislation or a positive law, we still must go and try. And that's how the crime against humanity was tried. So this goes on to say that where how you interpret the question of theory. Let me take you to another example. The Eichmann trial, the very famous Eichmann trials that took place, and it's about Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, after the Second World War from the Germany, runs away to Argentina and so on. Ben Gurion, the then Prime Minister in the 1950s of Israel, finds out that he is in Argentina, and they pick him up and get him to Israel. The central argument was Israel was not a state. And yet, how can Israel try when it was not in state in itself? 
and then they again come back to the support to the natural law idea that they have held. They will not, but every civilized system, the question of humanity comes into play. And there's an ethical about dignity, about each person, their lives of each person. And that is how they go on to try. So when, with a strong idea of positivism and a strong idea of uh, natural law, not every, is a, every thing is not a pure fit into it. Look at, despite having the law, the positivist view, we still went, uh, we went wrong in the case of the Dred Scott case. But despite having no positive law problems or, or the legal provisions not being present for the German trials, we still went on to say, well, there is an issue. And there is an issue of natural law. And that's what it is. As you develop today, you simply put the idea of utilitarian theory of maximum happiness. It may not be good. It will be affecting the way Japanese Americans got affected in the Second World War. So there is an intersection of law and morality at some place. The question of positive law and natural law, there is an intersection which actually gives the idea of realism. Let me explain this again to you, Nike. Let's, let's take the example as early as 2005, Shabina Begum, who goes to school in Luton, wearing a headscarf and a dress, is not allowed to come to school. She moves to court and says, well, this is my right to manifest my religious belief, and I may be permitted to do that. If simply, you will take the utilitarian principles of maximum happiness, then she would not have been allowed because the majority never believed that sh there is an idea that she should be permitted to wearing a jilba, which is the head scarf, which is here. And that is where you come to the idea of normative frames, where you accept realism, they accept the question of universalism and you go to the interest of normative jurisprudence and say, well, this is the way. So while there is no fit, but you need to go progressively into the domain of jurisprudence to say, well, there is, because there are certain forms which are independent of the maximum principle also. So that's how the whole idea develops of what theory. So if one theory does not fit into it, but for you to understand the context of how justice is delivered, you will always anchor yourself, you will require to anchor yourself into certain tenets of how the relationship between the sovereign, the law, the sanction, the judges take place. And you move ahead with that context in mind. Let's take the most case of uh, the decriminalization of 377 and look at the way it developed. The Nas Foundation, Kaushal Kumar judgment, the Nalsar, and then the Fred Singh judgment finally said. Now each of them, had the way to justify the judgments, deliver the judgment with a larger purpose. But each of them had their argument in its own. So every judge in his judgment and in any case has a perspective view to understand. The, the, the argument develops and no argument was wrong, but it's just at which you follow it. For example, the Nas Foundation, they went on to say, they decriminalize homosexuality. They said it is purposive and there's a question of normative jurisprudence comes into it. Kaushal Kumar very, very strongly positive it, recriminalized 377. You well said, well, that's the sovereign to do it, the legislator to do it. And you see Nalsar suddenly come. And the Naftaj Singh suddenly comes up on a domain of more normative, realist, and modified benefits. But you say, except like the Shamina Begin case, very few people, similarly LGBT, very few people, but they said, well, they have the question, the right to question of equality, the enable right of equality. And that's all. So every judgment, every theoretical perspective does not fit into one logic, but it has a meaning and the name of how it goes ahead. And that's what I'm trying to say. Now, let me ask you all a question. You, okay, before I come to this question, let me put it this way. How Wherever you see the idea of justice, it has in its, you can interpret it from the theoretical point of view and theories and these theories are not abstract principles. They really have an impact in society as we have grown. 
and as we have built up this context. Now, if you see the same idea, I will ask you one question that if you are the judge today, and you know TikTok has been banned because of the develop, I won't highlight the way the operation, the, the way the situation has developed. But, a, but an organization like, okay, Mukul organization, Mukul organization goes to the court and says, well, that argues that this should not be banned. It's a social media platform and the state has not really been able to prove the context of security. It is not enough that there is not great revenue that is coming up, but I feel that TikTok has a really empowering movement amongst, particularly amongst uh, the rural women. That's, they found a voice, they can, ex, they can uh, upload their, uh, their mind, their, their views, and so it's a question and you should not. So, so I'm, I'm arguing with you, I, I'm trying to put my case in front of you, right? And if you are the judge, and I ask you, how do you, would you say it? You'll say the state has been justified in national interest. And these are reasonable expression, uh, restrictions on free expression. Or you'll say, no, no, no. This ban is not justified as it violates free expression. And such self is unwarranted in the times of globalization. And third, you say you don't know. So the debate largely laws two ways. One is the way the law has come up and it's interpreted. And at one point of the segment, you will say, okay, no, no, this is about national interest. The law says they're reasonable and they're enough to say they're reasonable expectations, limitations. The second part you say, well, no, free expression has a larger mandate. And in this case, free expression is not a threat to the society per se or the public order. And therefore I feel as a judge, to do it. And somebody says like that and you say, okay, don't know what to do. And if I ask you through a poll, how do you look at this context? And if you are the judge today, and then let's see something, how it develops from here. So the poll is as a judge, how do you view the banning of TikTok in India? Justify it as a national interest. And these are reasonable restrictions on free expression or not justify that it violates free expression and such step is unwarranted in the times of globalization. Okay, let's have a poll and see what would you want. It's interesting, you know, I mean, I can see you all filling up and uh, a large portion of you have given a choice. Okay. Okay, we have 82. I can maybe try to make a century today in this poll. So let me see if I can wait for a little longer. Okay. Okay, 91, I think it's fair. Or you have 100, if I can try. Okay, another two seconds and I'll quit and I'll share it with you. Okay. So I end and I share the results with you. The results are clear. And most of you are significant, but 74% say yes, it is justified in national interest. And 23% says no, or 24% of you say no, it violates free expression. There's nothing wrong in it and there's nothing right about what you're saying. But you know, when you're looking at the theoretical finding, I say the theoretical finding is one is strongly on the law, the national interests, national sovereignty. The other context of you all look purely at from the context of free expression, individual rights or the human rights. And others about national. So see, uh, just on the debate of the Spelunian explorers, we always get fixed, or we we get, you know, blocked between each other's views to say, well, this is there's nothing wrong or right. 
But in any way, if I ask you to write down a 10 lines or 20 lines, you will realize that your judgments on delivering this kind of uh, case would develop from a legal theory. And once they develop from a legal theory, you will justify the question of national. In this case, 74% justify national interest. You strongly believe in this kind of national interest and the positivist view of the, of, uh, the complete theories. And so everybody has, and you have a strong leaning to it, and that's what it comes up. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, as I shared with you, and I say, I just have to remove this. That. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to I kind of say to you is that theories really give you the, this idea of the dispensation of justice. The question of justice is not that how it reverberates at that point in time, but it's an impact over a period of time. And I gave you these examples in both cases. And secondly, I say that when these things do go ahead in our lives, there's nothing wrong or right. And there's no particular theory that fails. We are in an imperfect world. But anytime you see the judgment or you deliver, when you deliver the judgment, you have to see the outcomes in some form. When you receive the judgments, you'll understand the purpose of doing it. The purpose in this case of free expression will be strongly oriented towards human rights. Or the judgment looking at the first option of national interest will be very strongly embedded in national, nationalism. The question of context of how the law should be there to control, get strict obedience from people. And that's again, theory comes into play. So with having time, I will stop here. But that's how I say no theory can be fixated to be good or wrong. But it is important for you all to understand the context of justice that does emanate from theories and to say that these theories are an important part of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there, I think one more thing that I wanted to say, and I will put this question open and later also, is the cycle reversing? Populism, you see all these things, but there is a political inclination on many of the judgments that have come to know. You have seen ourselves. There's a political issues. There is an issue of majoritarianism coming into. And do you think this idea of maximum happiness and utilitarian idea, which was losing its relevance, post the post world war and the normative idea hearts idea coming into play is taking us back into the root of pure utilitarianism in the mind and look from the idea of political advocacy of populism and majority and these questions will keep coming to us whenever the questions of what law is and law how ought to be or what is very vague to us and what vogue in the current time should be be we driven by popular sympathy or in cases of politically difficult prosecutions. And more importantly, I sum it saying and end up here to say it's all about social outcomes, the largest interest of humanity relevant across time. Thank you very much. I finished, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nashir Majid, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College, and the co-host for today's lecture. Now that the floor is open for questions, I'd like to pick out some questions put forward by the participants for Dr. Saxena. First, we have Ms. Soumya Rasing, Assistant Professor, <clears throat> Maharashtra NLU, Aurangabad. She asks, how far the normative understanding of natural law will help legislators to create an egalitarian legal framework or what in law will always remain an abstract concept. So. Okay, the egalitarian concept is definitely an aspirational idea, right? You'll agree with me. We are living in a very kind of, uh, this debate is kind of the judicial polarity, okay? where one, one segment of the school of thought believes in pure or unscrupulously following the rule of law, while the other way 
we're trying to look at how the law ought to be in the kinds and present times. And in both cases, how natural law will be, you embed yourself in the circumstance. Like I mentioned to you, the World War, you didn't have a provision of retroactive punishment, but you said there is a question of natural law that really comes in to dispense justice. And, let, and this is what I say, the law and morals are the cross-section of society. And how judgments thereafter take place, how the idea of social justice moves is that when a particular idea reverberates across time. Look at Amrit Sen's idea of justice as fairness. It always speaks on the question of justice and fairness and delivers itself ahead because it, it is relevant and across times. So to get even an egalitarian idea of the society, this conflict will forever be. But the idea is to reach to a realistic frame of the cross section to move ahead to the question of law and morality both or natural law. Thank you. Uh, now we have from Ms. Rachna Jha. She is pursuing LLM from Terry School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi. She asks, do you think if secularism in India and jurisprudential justice can be interlinked? If yes, kindly elaborate. I don't think that can be, uh, to be give you a very fair and direct answer because let's, uh, let's understand the, uh, I would like to put a perspective for you, okay? Religion and secularism is governed by the French concept of laicite, where you say the religion, the church and the state have a relationship in two forms. That the church, that the state neither subsidizes religion or advocates religion. And they say there's a separation between the two issues, right? Yeah. If this is the case, the case, as I told you about the French girl wearing the headscarf in school, mm -hmm. is a case where you say, laicite goes to the except we do not recognize religion. Sorry, we, are, we recognize religion. But we subsidize that. If you see other expressions, so this debate of secularism comes in the context of this relationship to religion. And what is purely together between both is that while here Lysita gets defined as the relationship between the church and the state, where the church neither recognizes religion or neither subsidizes religion, but it draws its strength from religion in the context of the political idea, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at jurisprudence, the intellectual inquiry about laws, rights, and wrongs impacts the relationship where a man in violation of himself is subjected to, but he enters into an agreement between the state. So that is the kind of relationship with a push and pull relationship with both. But to say that it would definitely come, I would not possible like that. I think if there's anything elaboration you can ask. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, then we have another question from Mr. Akhilesh Dureja. He is an assistant professor at Ikfa University, Dehradun. He asks, what would be the consequences of detaching morality from law? Okay. If you detach the question of morality from law, then the, then the traffic, when you were over speeding in the presentation over the red light, I will never understand your justification. Morality comes up with an inherent context of what you inherently owe and nobody does it wrong. It's a question of self-concept. When harm takes place on me, I, I revoke the idea of the harm to the question of justice and say they are my inherent rights to seek justice, to seek fairness. So there's a context of inherence in this idea. Right. I, I didn't follow. Can you can you just help me with the question again? I, I just lost yeah, the question. Uh, sure, sir. I'll uh, repeat the question. Yeah. What would be the consequences of detaching morality from law? Yeah. So if you kind of detach it, then your inherent self leaves as well. Okay. The question of self-concept of how I create morals and then how I connect to the society gets lost. True. And pure, dry persuasion of law 
can never render justice because it cannot stabilize over a period of time. Like I tell you, if you remove the question of morality as an alien, the idea of equality is the context of what you say, how morality would be defined or your own dignity. Mm -hmm. And I gave you this example of women not allowed to vote. If you only put the component of law in 1929, when we all were sitting in 1910, the law was very clear, you can't vote. Until unless somebody began to speak on the question of equality and said, well, this is not there. And there is a question of huge natural law premise of inherent rights that is with us. And that's what you see. The Declaration of Independence is a natural rights phenomenon that flows. It doesn't flow from a positivist view, pure from the view of national law. Thank you. Now I'd like to pick up a few more questions from the chat box. We have Mr. Baby Verma asking, does the social media in any way influence the decision making by the judges? Well, uh, a lot of cases in our own country are there. They believe that you have to have insul uh, complete isolation of what happened, but social media definitely makes a huge impact. The most recent cases definitely was there. Even if you say that the Talwar murder case was also given a wrong, uh, the Tanduri murder case where they, this was there. Everybody was strongly influenced by media. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there is a question of public accountability What Bentham speaks that public, uh, publicity is the soul of justice. And that's what Bentham speaks. If we go back to the theoretical perspective, if publicity is the soul of justice, then the bias and the inclination of the judges to respond to this kind of publicity and social media becomes, I won't say inherent, but becomes a very strong influencing factor in it. So social media definitely influences it. Uh, but yes, uh, there's certain times when social media did not, I mean, we, we, we moved thorough with the school of justice, was Afzal Guru's case, not, or not Afzal Guru, I mean, uh, Kasab's case. When everybody said there was a popular opinion in the media to say, well, no, 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 he should, there should be no trial and he should be hanged. But we said, no, 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 this is not the way it happens. The justice will be there. But to say that purely social media does not impact, I don't think. Social media has a huge influence in decision making now. Thank you. Next question we have from Advocate Nazifa Islam. She asks, my question is that if any law made for is that if any law is made for maximum benefit of for the maximum people, then what about the minimum number of people? Absolutely, I mean that's what I was uh, very nice. See, uh, you're right. That's what we speak about Benthamism when you speak about maximum happiness as maximum utility, and you say no, there is something called modified Benthamism. When you look at modified Benthamism, you say well. There is a normative context. It is not about maximum people and maximum happiness. It is also about the minority. And that's why when I told you the example of the of the American Japanese, Japanese Americans staying, then you say if there's a max they followed the maximum happiness principle where you said, okay, there are only a few people, they will oppose the war, let's put them into uh, detention and let's go ahead. But as you see how development has taken place. Then I referred you to the case of uh, Shabina Begi. Yes. Where you said, well, it is not maximum. If it was a question of maximum, 2003, four, or sorry, five rather, the French would have banned the headscarves in school and not allowed. Or maybe the UK also would have said, okay, you can't wear salwar suits or shalwar kami. That's Shabina Begi's case that you can't wear. But that a minority view always has been included. And then if you say, as you say, the globalization is moving up, the idea of universalism is actually coming into play. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, sir, uh, do you have a bit of time for a few more questions? Dr. Yeah, I have. Yes, please. Oh. Oh. So there's this one question uh, from Kasturi Chakravarti. She asks, with the view of some of the major cases from the apex Court, does it bring a clear picture that the government have an influence over the judgments? I have heard a lot of laymen say so. See, uh, apparently 
they may be, it's how you position yourself in your own argument, okay? And that's what I say, the self, your own self-concept defines your own morality. So if I'm looking at a particular case and I feel that this judgment has not happened to my idea of self-concept, and that's what I teach my leadership session is that your idea of self-concept becomes so important to your understanding of morality, okay? Uh, the second, and that's how you say you begin to draft and design it. And there are many cases that I held up. I mean, uh, one of the, there have been recent judgments which have given these indicators, but I think it is which form and how they get interpreted. But yes, there is a kind of, and you know why this is, I mean, one more thing that I spoke about is the question of populism, where the state actually looks at governing or influencing the key institutions of the country. I mean, it is not here in our country also. I mean, look at US. I mean, you will begin to read the recent debates about um, the Democrats and the Republicans presidential candidates. Like last time, it was about birth control, Planned Parenthood. And they wanted to say how the things was. The problem of the, the election of 2005 was not about Trump coming into power, but it was over the Republic comes come into power. The sitting judge, the, 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 the bench of the Supreme Court of America will have a dominant Republican representation. So I think the kind of political bias inherent into these things and which flow from here. Thank you. Thank now you, I'd like to take up uh, some questions uh, from the faculty of NEF Law College. We have uh, Mrs. Anurekha Goswami, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College, she asks, uh, Hello, sir. How Indian judiciary is helping to develop new jurisprudential theories in India? Uh, you look at, let's go back from, uh, let's go back as early as uh, the independence and the start. I, know, I, I don't really generally refer to these cases because everybody speaks of them. But yes, jurisprudence has truly developed. If you see the cases right from Menika Gandhi to kind of uh, Krishna, Krishna Iyer speaking about uh, procedure established by law to the question of right to life or reasonable, just fair and reasonable clause coming into play or you even if you see the Putu Swami judgment where you speak about privacy, or if you come down here, even in the NAS Foundation and subsequently, there is a developing and a rich kind of precedence of uh, the jurisprudence developing in our country. Definitely, I mean. Then we have another question uh, who's also faculty. Mrs. Satavisa Bora, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College. She asks, how do you draw the line between moral obligations and legal obligations? Do these obligations form the basis of justice under jurisprudence? Okay, I think this is the fight we have had. And I'm sure even if I finish this lecture, this fight in the jurisprudence, you know, uh, circles will always be there. But the defining law, like, like, defining context largely comes from the idea of its point of okay. intersection and its social outcome. And I began with my talk by saying that the social outcome is more important, no, rather not as important as how it will reverberate over a period of time. And I, that is what it would be from here also. also. But to say where this will be there, I think it will be the cross section of both what Hart says. It's about the cross section of two issues where you will come. And Another thing that you say that how judiciary comes really into play in the question of jurisprudence of law and morality is, as what largely cases when, uh, when, the, when the modern legal theory also comes and says is that when there are difficult cases, the judges should have enormous discretion to deliver judgments. So that's how I think the both intersection would come into play, but they will not go into conflict with each other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I think it is enough. Uh, we can proceed.